Okay, well, I think we're we're just about at, at um, five o'clock. So again, welcome to the second webinar within the FPR, FPMRS Fellows web, webinar series. Um, again, this is a joint effort between AUG, SUFU, and SGS, and we're grateful for their support of this endeavor. I'm Will Winkleman. I'm the third year fellow at Mount Auburn Hospital, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Today's webinar is, is titled Rectal Vaginal Fistulas and is presented by Dr. Patrick Culligan. Dr. Culligan is currently the Director of Urogynecology and Fellowship Director at Weill Cornell uh, Department of Urology in New York City. Our panelists today include Dr. Keisha Dyer at, San, at Kaiser San Diego and Kim Kenton at Northwestern in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Culligan will present for about 30 to 40 minutes and which time we'll open up the discussion to the panelists and then we'll be taking questions from the audience. Um, just a few housekeeping items um, in case anyone's watching for the first time. Um, I just want to re review kind of the format. Um, all the participants will be on mute. Please use the question and answer feature throughout the, throughout the presentation and then at the end for questions and we'll be monitoring that. Um, if you are having any sort of technical issues, AUG staff will be monitoring the chat feature. So address any issues in that portion. Um, at the end of the webinar, you'll be prompted to complete a brief survey and provide any feedback about the session. Please do take your time, take the time to fill that out. It is helpful for us planning these going forward. Um, and then I just want to let everyone know in case you're not there at the very end that our next webinar is scheduled on Friday, April 17th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time. And that'll be on the diagnosis and treatment of bladder emptying problems in women by Dr. Victor Nitti. Um, on, that, on that note, I'll hand it off to, to Dr. Dr. Culligan. Uh, thank you. Hey, everybody. Um, and I have to um, give some props to my buddies, um, Roger Goldberg and Peter Rosenblatt for coming up with this idea, even though they're right now relentlessly making fun of me for wearing a fleece and having a messy room. Um, they, did, they, they really came up with a great idea. So I appreciate being involved. I'm going to now go to my PowerPoint and try to share my screen. Let me see if I can do this. Sorry, guys. Here we go. How's that working? Anybody? Perfect. Looks great. Yep. Okay, so today's topic is rectovaginal fistula. And um, the these are my disclosures. The learning objectives are really just straight out of the learning objectives for fellowship training. And I want to start off by talking about the subclassifications. So we, we tend to just say everything's a rectovaginal fistula, but, but really technically, if um, the fistula occurs below the dentate line, then uh, we really call it an anovaginal fistula. And that's an important um, distinction, especially the closer the fistula is to the sphincter complex, the more difficult it is to treat. Uh, usually the cutoff is somewhere in the uh, less than or equal to three centimeters from the anal verge. A uh, rectovaginal fistula classic one is sort of above the dentate line, but still part of the rectum. And then we call it a colovaginal fistula if it involves bowel above the rectum. There's a, a further classification um, listed here, um, uh, which uh, came from a publication uh, by Sang and um, it further classifies fistulas into being either simple or complex based on size or um, uh, uh, previous failed repairs, especially, or radiation or, or, or cancer. Um, we all know that most rectovaginal fistulas um, in the Western world occur because of um, vaginal deliveries. Fortunately, it's not very common um, as associated with vaginal deliveries. And here are some of the risks, and they're also the risks for more difficult um, or instrumented uh, deliveries. In uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia, um, the prevalence is, is, is upwards of 2 million. So it's a, a lot more common where modern obstetrics is uh, less uh, readily practiced. Um, <clears throat> in addition to obstetrics, inflammatory bowel disease can produce uh, fistulas with up to 50% of uh, women with Crohn's disease developing some sort of a fistula in the area. Um, and um, ulcerative colitis, interestingly, and uh, Bichette's disease, um, those patients can uh, develop fistula, but usually it's a Crohn's disease that will get that. Infectious etiologies are listed here. 
Um, most commonly, I think diverticulitis is um, something that would produce a fistula, but it's also been described with uh, rectovaginal hematoma that could be related to uh, uh, surgical trauma, for example, or even a Bartholin cyst, especially a Bartholin cyst um, where there's been a complicated surgery involved. Um, we all have to remember that uh, fistula can be a result of cancer. And so um, we'll talk about that in the, in the workup uh, section of, the, of this discussion. Um, prior surgery or cancer, especially cancer um, surgery or cancer treatments related to radiation um, can produce rectovaginal fistula. And then there's um, the very much lesser um, uh, causes such as a mechanical injury. I have seen at one time where a Gellhorn pessary that had been neglected for years um, wound up um, going through the uh, vagina into the rectum and was um, uh, really a, a plugging a rectovaginal fistula that was rather large. That was a difficult surgery. Um, and then congenital sometimes can be uh, a cause. The presenting symptoms tend to be, um, if not vaginal passage of stool, at least uh, a muco, mucopurulent discharge or gas, um, and um, often dyspareunia or um, vaginal infections. <clears throat> it's very important when, when trying to determine whether or not there's a rectovaginal fistula present to evaluate the continence status of the patient as well, because especially since most of them are obstetric and um, it, most of these injuries are related to some sort of a um, laceration or um, uh, external anal sphincter or um, some sort of sphincter injury um, that was sustained at the time of delivery, um, they would be uh, in, in coordination with a repair and that the fistula would happen. And so if the, if the repair is failing, then the fistula um, could be um, happening in addition to fecal incontinence or anal incontinence. So it's important for that patient to be fully worked up for um, an intact sphincter or not. Um, obviously, uh, one of the hallmarks of uh, physical exam is gonna be inflammation. Um, and you definitely also always have to keep malignancy or infection in mind. Um, it's a good idea to do um, uh, anoscopy or um, endoanal ultrasound sometimes um, and um, looking for the extent of the fistula. It can be very helpful to use lacrimal duct probes to uh, find the path of the fistula if they're rather, rather small. If there's no history of an obstetrical event or trauma or inflammatory bowel disease, you have to consider malignancy as a primary suspect. Um, for these patients, um, you, you would definitely want to get a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis with and without contrast. And you might consider that for um, anyone with a rectovaginal fistula, depending on um, how well you can associate it with an obvious cause. The workup can also include um, um, a more complicated set of tests. Probably the easiest thing to do if, you, if you're having trouble finding the actual fistula site would be to do what we call the flat tire test, which is um, placing the patient's um, bottom on uh, some sort of elevated um, a pillow or something, and then instilling uh, water into the vagina and uh, blowing bubbles into the uh, rectum with an anoscope and, and watching for bubbles coming into the vagina. That would be um, the way to, to look for a tract. Also, uh, you can do uh, vaginography, although um, vaginography and fistulograms um, sound better than, than they work. Actually, it's, it, in my experience, they've been sort of difficult to um, uh, actually pull off. And endoanal ultrasound is, is, of course, mostly looking at the um, uh, uh, external and internal anal sphincters to uh, correlate with um, uh, the presence or absence of fecal incontinence or, or anal incontinence and the need for a, a repair that involves a sphincter. MRI can be um, uh, excellent, but is also probably overkill. Most fistulas really can be found on physical exam or proctoscopy or both. Uh, so I mentioned fistula fistulography is useful in theory. It sounds good, but um, the, the radiologists really don't do a lot of these tests. And uh, but I'll be interested to hear what the panelists have to say about this at, um, when we're when I'm finished up with these slides. But um, in my experience, anyway, um, I haven't found uh, fistulograms to be very helpful. Uh, here's just a, a slide that um, lists the various uh, imaging modalities. 
And again, I don't think you have to do these with um, most patients. Most patients are going to have some kind of obstetric history that you can um, ascertain. And then on physical exam, you can find the fistula. And if you do that, then you've, you really don't need um, imaging for, for those patients when you've got an obvious site. So treatment options, there's always observation. Observation can be appropriate, um, especially if you can um, just give that patient symptomatic relief by stool bulking. Um, so if a patient is willing to take fiber and maybe even Imodium to make their um, stools more firm throughout the day, then they might be able to get by. And a lot of women, especially after um, just having a baby, are not in a convenient position to have uh, what will be a somewhat de debilitating surgery and uh, at least have some significant morbidity. So thinking of how to manage them and get them by with their symptoms until they're in a better place to um, uh, have surgery is kind of important. Um, that brings up a point I want to make sure to ask the panelists what they think about um, uh, asking patients to discontinue breastfeeding um, as uh, an adjunct to uh, a successful repair. Um, medical treatment for, for Crohn's only um, would be appropriate. Um, and uh, fibrin sealant, I've not used this before. And again, I'd like to hear what the panelists have to say about that. But there are some uh, reports of up to 74% resolution rate, probably for just very small fistula. The timing of surgical repair is extremely important. Um, again, going back to the most common cause, which is obstetric, um, it, especially if, if these um, fistula are, are in coordination with maybe having a patient having had a, a third or fourth degree episiotomy repair and all the sort of pain and suffering associated with that, there can be a lot of um, uh, prolonged induration and poor healing. And if you try to go back and fix, uh, especially that, that sphincter, but even that fistula in the early time frame, because you're trying to do that patient a favor, you may not really be doing that patient a, much of a favor after all, because if the fistula repair you attempt early breaks down, then um, they're going to have a much harder course afterwards. So, the um, if you can get uh, if you can get three months after delivery, um, and um, and then that may even be longer depending on the breastfeeding situation. Then, um, then that's best, I think, for, for patients to have the best chance of their primary repair being the, um, oops, the uh, successful repair. So it brings up one of the first uh, questions. Um, so in, for the fellows um, that are anticipating to take their test, um, this question reads, which of the following is not one of the principles of surgical correction of, best, uh, excuse me, of rectovaginal fistula repair? A, a watertight seal of rectal mucosa and vaginal epithelium. B, interpose a layer of fresh vascularized tissue. C, tension-free closure of all tissue layers. And D, interrupt the continuity of the fistula tract. So I'll let you think about your answer. And the answer is A. Um, the, the key to this answer is that it says watertight seal of rectal mucosa and vaginal epithelium. It's actually even appropriate sometimes to leave, if necessary, the, the um, vaginal side, which is the low pressure side of the repair, uh, somewhat open. And so um, the rest of B, C, and D are all um, elements of the surgical principles for rectovaginal fistula repair. Principle of surgery, again, proper timing is the main thing, minimizing granulation tissue affection and, and, and edema. Um, it's very important to do a wide mobilization of adjacent tissue planes. So that usually means starting with a, a, um, a if not a, a perineal incision, then an incision near the perineum to um, get a, as wide of a, a mobilization of adjacent planes as you can. Um, you um, need to excise the fistula tract completely and then perform a multi-layer closure. I use um, 2O and 3O Vicryl, um, trying to avoid any dead space along the way. And again, the, sometimes um, with a larger fistula, it can even be difficult to bring the vaginal epithelium together without um, a little bit of tension. If that's the case, then it, it's not inappropriate to leave that last layer somewhat open, even if necessary. So here's just um, uh, a few other things about a high fistula repair. It's usually related to diverticulitis um, and or inflammatory bowel disease. Um, the potential clues are gonna be a strange discharge. When I've seen these patients, um, it's been 
typically a post hysterectomy patient where um, they're describing a very unusual discharge that's intermittent. And you might even have trouble finding the actual discharge initially, but um, uh, because it can be even you know, a small bowel also involved in this, but usually it would be uh, a colovaginal fistula um, where you're seeing more liquidy stool that might not even look like stool um, and a lot of excoriation, a very miserable patient usually. Um, you're going to want to consider a, a robotic approach uh, slash open abdominal approach. Um, and um, it, it's not inappropriate to start robotically and just counsel the patient that they may need to have a, a laparotomy. I'm saying robotic instead of laparoscopic because at least in my experience, straight stick laparoscopy for these repairs would be um, exceedingly difficult. But I'd like to hear the panelists' uh, view on that. Um, there's going to be a resection of the bowel segment. Um, and, um, and a primary anastomosis usually, it would be very inappropriate to, um, for example, close the uh, colonic defect and close the vaginal defect and expect for a good result there. So going back to vaginal repairs, um, this is just a kind of a simple um, uh, set of diagrams about a simple fistula uh, showing wide uh, mobilization of tissue and removal of the fistula tract followed by closure in layers. So I do an interrupted um, layer, usually with either 3 or 2-0 um, for, the, for the first layer. And then um, the next layer typically probably in the same direction as the first layer. And then, um, and then it doesn't matter after that, just trying to get um, as many layers as I can and, um, and closing with, with no tension and leaving no dead space. That's what I'm trying to do. I find the Lone Star Retractor very helpful um, for repair of these fistula. It's also um, sometimes um, done to do a, a perineoproctotomy. You have to be very careful if you're gonna do this. There are um, textbooks and, and surgeons that recommend this almost every time. I think that it can be appropriate for ano uh, vaginal fistulas that are directly adjacent to the sphincter, especially if the sphincter is not intact. But if a patient has an intact sphincter and they have solid stool fecal continence, then um, I'm not gonna be very quick to cut through a sphincter, even if it's, um, there's a defect there uh, where there, there might be intervening scar tissue um, after a um, repair. So the scar tissue may be at the you know, 12 o'clock or, or just around the 12 o'clock position. Um, if it's working and they're continent to solid stool, me personally, I'm not gonna want to uh, disrupt that. And I'm gonna try to repair the fistula without disrupting the sphincter. But this is another technique. Um, it's basically like redoing an episiotomy repair. There's also um, the endoanal advancement flap, which is typically done in the prone position. And, um, and I've been involved in these cases, but it usually works like this. If the patient goes to the colorectal first and the colorectal surgeon likes to do an advancement flap and that, and that doesn't work, then the colorectal might send the patient to me to do the next step transvaginally and vice versa. If I've got a a case, especially an ano vaginal fistula where I maybe didn't have success the first time because it was a very complicated uh, case or maybe it was my first try but not the first try, then my next step would be to send the patient to uh, a colorectal and maybe be involved in that advancement flat surgery. So here's the next of our questions. It says, a 34-year-old prima para whose delivery was complicated by a third degree perineal laceration subsequently underwent a layered closure type surgical repair of a rectovaginal fistula by another surgeon in a different subspecialty. She was dissatisfied with the outcome of the repair um, because she, and she pre presents to you for further evaluation. The most likely cause of her dissatisfaction is, I've kind of been hinting at the answer to this question all along. Most likely she's dissatisfied because um, she had anal incontinence all along in addition to the fistula, and that wasn't addressed by a simple fistula repair. She actually had a, uh, possibly a need for, for an uh, adjunct sphincteroplasty or um, some other uh, fecal incontinence type repair. So for a low or mid-level fistula, um, the success rates should be very, very good. Um, I, I think that, um, I mean, anytime you see 100% success rates, you got to question that, but it's close. If you get the good primary repair, especially if it's um, not um, directly adjacent to the um, external um, sphincter, then you should expect uh, excellent results.
Um, so the, the, the point of this slide mainly is that patients with um, uh, fecal incontinence prior to their surgery um, are gonna remain incontinent of, of um, feces after an advancement flap and often even after a sphincter repair. For complex fistulas, there's, um, there's some other techniques that are uh, useful and, and um, uh, rarely performed, um, such as uh, gracilis muscle um, interposition. But a martius flap is, is um, often a standard uh, part of a fistula repair. I'd be interested in, in, to hear what the panelists have to say about that. I, I rarely do a martius um, uh, graft. Um, because typically I find the blood supply to be excellent uh, for the tissue in the area and, and I, I don't generally uh, do that. Um, if you're going to go uh, and do an abdominal approach for a complex fistula, then um, uh, colonic uh, diversion is going to be one of the principal elements there. Usually that's going to be a, a series of staged operations where um, the patient gets a colostomy maybe a, as, a, as a first step and then let the tissue cool down around the fistula long enough to where it uh, really has uh, nice tissue quality because nothing, nothing's coming through there and then do a fistula repair and then still wait probably another three months um, before reversing the colostomy. So if, if a patient's gonna go through that process, it's usually gonna be after more than one failed attempt at a vaginal repair. Um, bioprosthetics, I hear about different um, uh, graft materials that people use sometimes as an interposition. Um, I am uh, suspect of some of these results, but included them just because uh, I wanted to be complete with the um, uh, inclusion of the literature. Um, I'd be interested again to hear what the panelists have to say about whether or not they use bio bioprosthetics um, as a part of a t repair, either um, an initial primary repair or um, a follow-up repair after a failure. Temporary diversion, again, it's, it's um, it's probably the, the most successful um, thing you could do um, uh, overall, but nobody would do this uh, because of the high success rates of a primary repair. Nobody's gonna suggest a, a temporary diversion for the standard uh, rectovaginal fistula. But when a patient has either a radiation injury or severe infection or multiple previous attempts, let's say the first attempt was done two weeks after a delivery or something silly like that, and, and then they've had multiple attempts since then, then you really need to talk to the patient about a, a temporary um, diversion, but um, it, it's gonna temporary in name only. I mean, it, it, this whole thing could be, you know, six months, nine months, or even a year before the patient's actually has a, um, a, a reanastomosis and, and is um, pooping normally. Um, as far as perioperative management goes, I, um, always give these patients a bowel prep. It's one of the only situations where I still ask the patients to do a mechanical bowel prep and clear liquids. And I actually go an extra mile and I'll, I'll ask them to only stay with clear liquids for a few days until they're having a, like a regular bowel movement after the surgery. Um, we're always gonna do uh, prophylactic antibiotics, broad spectrum. Um, Post-operative, um, you know, I think a, a, a low residual diet's important and stool softeners are, are pretty common. I think most of us would avoid, uh, ask the patients to avoid intercourse for uh, until it's well healed. Um, again, I'm interested in what the panel has to say about that too. And that's actually my entire <laughs> presentation. I guess I went through it sort of fast. So I'm going to um, unshare the screen and, um, and I'm interested to hear from our panelists. Hey guys. Hi, great. Thank you for thank you for an excellent presentation. I think you brought up a lot of really good points that I think our um, our discussion panel can talk a little bit more about. Um, do um, anything in particular that 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 um, e either of you on the panel are interested in talking about to start? Um, otherwise, I took a few notes about some of the some of the points I can bring up as well. Maybe we can talk a little bit about the timing of repairs. Um, you kind of mentioned 
you know, after delivery, you often will wait kind of two to six months after delivery. I'd, I'd like, it'd be interesting to hear kind of in terms of the timing when the, when the rest of you are thinking about repairs, or even if you had a patient who came in, for example, a week after, um, a week after delivery, or who had a fourth degree at the, at the time and was sent right to your office, when are you, when are you thinking about repair for those types of patients? So one of my actual partners, Christina Lewicka, we have a large, we do about 13,000 deliveries a year at Northwestern, and they use a disproportionate number of forceps. So we have an entire clinic on Friday afternoons of just women that have third and fourth degree tears. So we subsequently see a fair number of break breakdowns. She just actually looked at 20 women who she repaired early. Um, the median day to repair was about nine days and had a 100% success rate. Um, that said, she carefully picked those patients. They weren't infected, um, or if they were infected, she got them out far enough that she treated the infection. Um, so we've really gotten to the, in the postpartum patients, repairing them early um, when the tissues look healthy, like Dr. Culligan had said during his talk, um, with pretty good success rates. And were you talking about um, nine patients with fistulas that were repaired early or just episiotomy breakdowns? No. 20 patients with fistulas or breakdown of their obstetric anal sphincter injury and were repaired and then got referred in and repaired. So there were 20 patients who were repaired on average nine days from when they got where when it broke down. I mean, I have a hard time calling that a fistula and more likely calling it like a breakdown of the primary repair, but um, but she, only people were included in the series are people that she thought felt the tissues were healthy enough to repair early. So we've sort of gotten away from like making those women wait six weeks um, to being repaired if things look good. Sort of a unique population at Northwestern, thanks to all the MFMs doing forceps, keeping us in business, man. Um, is there some sort of a, an aggressive uh, wound treatment going on? Um, uh chlorhexidine or who knows what? I mean, the, what, what are you doing to prepare those wounds? Um, she does do perioperative antibi antibiotics and sends them home on five days of ciproflagyl. Um, and obviously if, if the wounds are infected when they initially present, then she treats them with antibiotics prior to taking them back. And this is all Christina Lowicki Gop's work, not mine. Um, and then she tends to, like, if there's like a big suture mess going on, I feel like there's a lot of vicral sutures, like in those people, um, she'll actually take out the, in, the sutures, debride, and then wait till the tissues look healthy enough to repair. Um, but like I said, all of those, I think, were, were, were repaired within 30 days, and the median was nine. Hmm. Dr. Dyer, do you also, you know, I, I, there have been a few panelists or a few um, um, participants who are asking about antibiotics as well. Do you also do antibiotics after your, your repairs? Um, definitely we do the intra-op, you know, usually an ANSAP yeah. flagell kind of combination. As far as keeping them on perioperative antibiotics, it's probably more of a case by case in, in our experience. If we do have concerns, like maybe we're taking them back because they're frustrated and we're doing a little bit on the earlier end, um, then we might do a perioperative course a few days before and continue after maybe total for a week, but it's certainly not standardized. And even amongst our group, it varies, um, you know, on a case by case basis, I would say. Um, and I guess and another question is kind of, what do you do for recurrent fistulas? You know, sometimes these are the primary gynecologist has tried to fix it, or sometimes these are even ones that we've tried to fix on our own and they come back. Do you have a different surgical approach or does it, does anyone change their approach or do you kind of approach it the same way and just kind of, you know, hope, hope that things are a little bit different the second time around? Um, I, I would say for us, um, and generally, I mean, yeah, I would want it if available, take a look at the operative report, look at what was done, the extent of what was done. I think definitely making sure if there was um, a board that was not 
previously and if that's contributing to the failure, um, making sure to evaluate that further and address it. Um, and uh, uh, also the use of flaps, sometimes that's where those might come into play. If I know someone has had like a good first round repair and um, you know, they come back with a recurrence that may, um, and if it's distal, then we would consider adding a Marsh's flap in that scenario and have done that before. What, what's everyone's approach to the Mardius flap? Do people use, use Dopplers to make sure there's good blood supply? Do you find that patients notice that there's a asymmetry in, in, the, in the tissue postoperatively that they complain about? Um, Um, I would say that um, we definitely counsel and warn them about the cosme potential cosmesis issues afterwards. But um, fortunately, most of them end up looking, you know, quite well um, once they're fully healed. Um, I have seen someone develop a hematoma in that area. So careful attention. It was very hemostatic during the case but postoperatively she did develop that. So we didn't have a blood supply issue. Um, so, um, but in general, um, usually just on examination, you do want to examine it preoperatively and just look and make sure you have a decent amount of fat pad there to work with and then making sure to maintain um, the, the blood supply at the base of it, so. Similar to Dr. Culligan, I rarely find it necessary to use Martius. Um, when I am, I do mention that there may be some asymmetry, but at that point, most women are in such dire straits that the asymmetry is the least of the things they're worried about. Um, the place where I've actually found them the most useful is in working with our colorectal surgeon who takes care of a lot of women with really, really inflammatory bowel, bowel disease like I've never seen before. Um, in most American women in this country who are, have postpartum birth trauma, um, usually you can get enough mobilization of the rectum and the, the vagina that I, I don't really find it that necessary. The other place where I think they're helpful is in patients who have had radiation. Um, yeah. Have either of you um, uh, done many of the uh, uh, piezoproctotomy type of repairs of a, of a fistula? Um, Never. Yeah, yeah. completely okay. agree. Don't do that. Okay, just making sure. What about, I like what about go <laughs> anal advancement flaps, though, when they're reasonably distal and um, and going through the sphincter. Yeah, you said you, you would you do that. Will you recommend that as your primary repair in that situation? If it's just a small one that's like, like a little tiny thing, like jutting through the fistula. Yeah, usually I don't do it the way that the books show it, where you make a big cut flap. But usually the same way you can mobilize anterior vaginal wall, like on a fourth. You know, if you're doing like a posterior repair or something you can usually take that same approach rectally and just like kind of advance the whole rectal mucosa and cut the part with the fistula in it off. And I find that that's pretty easy and works pretty well. And I do it with the patient in dorsal lithotomy because- Really? I do. Wow. That Lone Star Man, you can see all sorts of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's interesting, I didn't think about that. <clears throat> You think that maybe you could, oh. I'm sorry, I just, uh, uh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, maybe, do you think maybe you could all speak a little bit more about your approach to a fistula pair when there's involvement of the sphincter complex or you know, if there's a patient who has fecal incontinence and also has a fistula, do you address those at the same time? Do you do those separately? What do you guys do, Keisha? Um, that definitely, I, I love that you emphasize that a lot throughout your talk because I think it's something that can be easily um, missed, you know, in the patient who's talking about stool per vagina, you know, at some point, especially, you know, a lot of times you end up having to work on stool consistency with them first. Um, so it might be hard for them to delineate where exactly all of the stool that they're noticing is 
stress or injury while you're in there doing the fistula repair, um, you know, uh, makes sense if it's in close proximity. Certainly if the sphincter is intact, you know, definitely would not incorporate any of that in the repair. Um, but, you know, that's where maybe I might include getting endoanal ultrasonography to take a look at the sphincter um, preoperatively. So I, I kind of know what to expect going in, especially if they do report anal incontinence as well. So if they report anal incontinence and their sphincter's disrupted on endoanal ultrasound, so there's just intervening scar tissue, but it's not really working, and the fistula is right next to the um, what's left of that uh, area, the perineum and sphincter. In that case, would you cut it all open and, and close it like an episiotomy? Yeah, I, I would definitely, I would want to mobilize the sphincter as much as possible and then do either an approximating or overlapping repair of that sphincter muscle as well as identifying the fistula tract, you know, addressing that um, in a layer tension-free fashion. So yeah, I mean, in, in that case, if there's a disruption incorporated in their fistula, um, yeah, I would correct the whole thing. I agree. And uh, Kim, what about biologics? Do you guys have any? Yeah, I sort of think about biologics the way you think about biologics. <laughs> and in terms of actual fistula tract, do you guys have a rule of thumb in terms of how wide your margins are or how much do you undermine or is it more kind of on an individual basis just so you get that tension free closure? You know, do you try and get a do one you, centimeter? Do we excise the fistula tract? Uh, yeah, do, yeah. If no. you, have... I, you know what I do is um, Peter Rosenblatt's got a great uh, video on taking a punch biopsy and sliding it down a lacrimal duct probe. Um, and then that's, that's the, of course, the lacrimal duct probe is going through the fistula. And then uh, using that as sort of a very clean, but um, efficient and sort of not big uh, way to take out the fistula tract. And I think that video is available either in the AUGS or the SGS site. But um, I, I, I imitated his idea and, and it worked really well. Are there any questions that um, the um, participants have asked? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I've been, I've been. Um, some of these have kind of been from the audience as well. Um, looks like there are a few people who are kind of asking about the perioperative care in terms of, you know, maybe hearing other people's perspectives as well. We heard a little bit from Dr. Culligan that you kind of do a, a pre-op bowel prep and then post-operatively kind of a little bit of a slow advancement. I'd love to hear kind of the perspectives on from your, the other two as well, Dr. Kent and Dr. Dyer. Um, so. We no longer bowel prep people. I've gotten away from that. It makes the surgery so much nicer when there's no bowel prep. Um, get, like I said, we give an intra-op dose of ciproflagyl and then we give them five days of ciproflagyl at home. We actually have them follow up within three days of surgery um, and then weekly um, until the patient feels like they're good. Um, and this is sort of because we have this standing um, Peapod like clinic of perioperative moms, it makes that easy to do. Um, and then this is a difference in of our practice, but Dr. Lewicki Gauk, who has the most experience, actually does them, has them do sits baths twice a day. Never been a fan of those, but she's got data to support her work. I don't, so we'll have to go with that. Hmm. And then do you guys want to make fun of me or anything about? My idea about the the uh, breastfeeding. I mean, the the poor estrogen levels. Um, I at least in my mind, anyway, they they seem like they would lead to uh, worsened repair or worsened healing. Um, Christina puts them all on vaginal estrogen because she feels thinks that too. Okay, what do you think? Honestly, most of them go to her. So I mean, I think the vaginal estrogen makes sense. I definitely think this. I don't know if that's going to really. There's so many ways that estrogen can be helpful in that situation. If you look at the animal data, um, gonadal steroids given immediately after a neuromuscular injury can facilitate neuromuscular ingrowth too. So if I personally had one, I would probably not breastfeed because I'd want my, I would want to have systemic, 
systemic levels of estrogen that were normal. But based on the fact that I have no data to prove that and like the La Leche people would be all over us. Um, so she also noticed though, I'll tell you, she gives vaginal estrogen, but we recently did a basic science study because she gives vaginal estrogen and she had a observation that the estrogen made the patients have more granulation tissue anecdotally. Um, so I haven't seen the results yet, but she, we just completed a basic science study looking like taking a piece of the granulation tissue in patients that were estrogenized and ones that want, weren't estrogenized to seeing if there was any change in estrogen receptors in the patients who got estrogen to see if it upregulated them more to come. But I think you're right. What about you, Keisha? Um, you, you see a lot of these patients, right? Yeah, um, yeah, you know, definitely, I, I do think the breastfeeding and the atrophy that can come along with that is a factor. And, um, and so we, we definitely use vaginal um, estrogen perioperatively in, in that setting. And then a lot of times it also overlaps with some of the other things that you see, like pain with intercourse, and even, you know, some irritative urinary symptoms in that, um, post-operative period that will sometimes um, use some vaginal estrogen for. So we have a low threshold for kind of using that um, for a lot of reasons in the postpartum period. So um, yeah, but I, I certainly could see it being a factor in your, you know, planning and timing of your repair and getting good wound healing theoretically, you know. And are you prescribing that usually like a twice weekly regimen, like for postmenopausal women, or do you do it a little bit more frequently? Yeah, um, probably a little bit of both, but yeah, if, if they have significant symptoms and the tissue looks like it needs it and it, their symptoms include like pain with intercourse and things like that, then we might have them use it more frequently and then, then go down to more of a maintenance until they stop breastfeeding and their menstrual cycles like resume like normal. Oh. Maybe just changing yeah, topics a little bit. I'd like to hear a little bit about. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, that was it. Sorry. Oh. Um, I was just going to change topics a little bit and talk talk about imaging. Um, Dr. Culligan mentioned a little bit that you know if you if you see it on exam, you don't necessarily need need imaging. Um, are there times when you when you routinely get imaging, are there, are, do you universally get imaging on patients who have, have, you know, have a rectovaginal fistula or suspected rectovaginal fistula and what kind of is your imaging modality of choice? I, can, I, don't, I don't routinely, so I'm interested in what you guys have to say. Yeah, I don't routinely either. And then it's basically if I, I mean, if the sphincter is obviously disrupted, then there's kind of no point. The time that we'll occasionally do imaging our patients where we suspect a rectovaginal fistula that's small that we can't see on physical exam, or we expect, anticipate that it's snaking through the sphincter complex. Um, and then usually th use 3D ultrasound with hydrogen peroxide um, in the rectum, which can actually, you can see the bubbles come up like nicely on ultrasound through the, through the fistula tract. So, um, uh, Dr. Ken, actually, can you describe that ultrasound technique again, a little bit in a little bit more detail? Like, because that's sure. That if you can helpful. see the fistula, you can inject just using like a like a catheter, or a needle, like a small, like a, what are the ones they use for IVF? We keep some of those. Um, okay. And inject it into the fistula tract, but we've even had success putting the three D probe transvaginally and then putting hydrogen peroxide in the anus and then kind of milking it up like through the and you can see the bubbles come up the one caveat with it is the hydrogen peroxide burns so like if you can avoid not doing it i think that's a better to not do it but sometimes if you're just really can't find it and you really have a high suspicion it's helpful and cheaper than mri <laughs> Yeah, because we're we're the same. I mean, imaging, um, you know, is usually not excessively helpful, but certainly some of those. Uh, 
disease hysterectomy patient, and maybe you see a distal, uh, sorry, a dimple at the cuff, and you're not certain if there's actually any, um, you know, the patient is describing symptoms, but you can't really see a clear fistula on exam. So for those high ones, occasional fistula gram, I mean, those ones we usually end up communicating directly with the radiologist and like explaining their history in detail and what exactly they're looking for so they can, you know, conduct the imaging test in the way that's most likely for them to visualize that contrast coming, timing the imaging so that they can visualize the contrast um, coming through the fistula. And then still they often will not see it. So it's really <laughs> just those difficult situations where the patient is bothered and you can't find it, will rarely use it. There have been a, a few viewers who have kind of asked about colorectal surgery and kind of involving them. Are there are there specific cases? Or are there times when you think that they should be involved? Um, do you kind of only involve them for the more complicated or when things fail? Or if you're thinking about a diversion, um, what are your kind of thoughts on on kind of when when to involve kind of that other that other side of things? I would involve them if it's usually if there's underlying inflammatory bowel disease or if it's the one in my career, maybe two in my career patients that I think need a diversion. Um, and usually I would just have them bring up an oop, loop ileostomy. Mm. Yeah, I, I also would um, rarely, if ever, in, involve them unless there was a really complicated situation. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, I mean, we are, as urogynecologists, we're in that space a lot more than they are, um, especially in this kind of way. And so, um, uh, I think that, you know, we're the appropriate folks to take care of that problem. Yeah, and I would say it's the same, same at our place. They usually actually send the rectovaginal fistulas to us. Um, and occasionally we have gotten patients where they may have um, attempted a prior advancement flap. Um, we had a really, like, the poor patient had, it was like, two or three recurrences prior to coming to us. So came to us with a colostomy already in place. Um, that's how bothered and severe her symptoms were. And then um, they joined for the reoperation on her, but um, so she came to us diverted already, but that's usually the scenario. I guess I have another question kind of from, from one of the fellows um, about kind of your, your experience with rectovaginal fistulas. Do you think that you got the training that you needed to do those after, after you finished fellowship? Do, is it because you're kind of in centers and referral centers that you got the volume? How do you kind of recommend that fellows go about getting the, the experience for, you know, for these types of things? Or do any of you go abroad and, and take care of patients? Um, I'll start. I mean, I think that, um, we're, you know, during our fellowships, you know, we're in that space all the time, whether or not you're taking care of a rectovaginal fistula, you're doing surgery around the perineum and, 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 and on the vaginal epithelium and surrounding tissues. So, and, you know, as a, if you're trained in um, OB first, then surely you've had some experience with um, third and fourth degrees. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> I mean, you're not going to get a huge number of rectovaginal fistula cases during your fellowship. I mean, if you got five or six, that would be you know, probably as much as, as, as anybody gets. But again, um, it's sort of like tag you're it, right? I mean, we, you have the most experience and, um, and so who else is better to do it? I mean, if you can, you can watch videos, you can look at Peter Rosenblatt's uh, video that I mentioned, you can, you, and then just go do it because um, it's not rocket science. I mean, you know, so even if you haven't had a ton of experience, you probably are the best one in your area to, to take care of it. And, and you could always bring in a senior partner if you have that luxury. Yeah, I would say that one of the things that I would want all the fellows to like hear is mu if much of what you're doing now isn't going to be what you're doing in five or 10 or 15 years from now, if we're moving forward as a field. And so the thing that you should be most learning in your fellowships is basic tenets of surgery, traction, counter traction, how do you like, Fistulas are all the same, whether it's a vesicovaginal, a urethrovaginal, 
or a recto or a recto vaginal. Like there's certain concepts that you need to be able to mobilize. You need to be able to have your repair like under as minimal tension or no tension as possible. Um, and I think the other thing that's really important kind of reiterating what Dr. Culligan said is, I think that we sometimes as gynecologists and neurogynecologists like think other people know more than we do. And you know what, we're pretty well trained and we're pretty broadly trained. And even if you haven't done a hundred like rectovaginal fistulas or sphincter repairs during your training, like you understand that anatomy and how these injuries happen in women, I would argue better than probably any other specialist or subspecialist out there. Um, so some of it is just like Dr. Culligan said, watching videos, talk to people. If you have a case that comes in, call, talk to people, you know, call Dr. Culligan, call Dr. Dyer, call your program directors and talk it through with them. And then really just stepping up and, and, and doing the best you can to take care of that patient. Okay, I well. totally agree with, you know, both what um, Dr. Kenton and Dr. Culligan said and, and that, you know, you use your resources. And so if, if you are uncertain or it's complex or recurrence that, you know, it's, it's um, okay to recruit the help of a senior partner or getting advice from um, your mentors um, outside to make sure that you're comfortable with your surgical plan and then know that you're going to have to adapt that plan based on whatever is presented in front of you in the OR and that you have kind of the tools um, in your toolbox to do that. Kind of on, on the topic of reaching out to experts, one of, one of the fellows was presented with a case a patient had diabetes, grade four prolapse, and underwent a bilateral sacrospinous. She did fine for the first two weeks and then Week three was noted to have a fistula at the apex. What would, how would you guys approach that type of patient in terms of your workup and your surgical approach to, to a fistula after a sacrospinous? Um, how soon after the um, repair, the prolapse repair, did the um, fistula occur? Uh, she was fine at her, her for her first two weeks, and it was noted that by week three she was noted to have a fistula. Yeah, um, I don't. I mean, I I would be considering a little bit in that case, especially that it's so soon after the repair that the proximity of the suspension sutures may, you know, may have been. Um, too close, you know, to the um, rectum itself. And, um, and I mean, I know we always do like a rectal exam at the end of our prolapse repairs, but it kind of speaks to, um, you know, how close that repair is. And I've also seen where people, patients that you're following for years, um, when uh, with the bilateral sacral spine, uh, sacral um, spinous suspension with mesh. Um, people who subsequently go in for colonoscopy um, in speaking and collaborating with our GI docs, you know, they'll often comment that there's kind of a sharp turn that their, their scope has to go through when they've had like a bilateral suspension. So it is kind of interesting and concerning that the secondary effects of some of the things that we do um, in correcting prolapse. Um, but as far as the question about, you know, how you would go about repairing, I think some of the same principles would apply, making sure that um, any inflammation, there's no infection. Um, and if so, you know, treating that and doing a delayed repair versus going right back in if, you obviously think maybe you placed a stitch that went through. Um, I haven't seen that. And so maybe some of the others might want to comment. I'd say it depends on what the stitch is. What, um, so if they're used the permanent, permanent sutures, then um, you might want to think about taking those permanent sutures out um, sooner rather than later. And even a delayed absorbable, sometimes, you know, PDS lasts for a long time. And um, so that's, I think in this exact situation, I, I, I might be inclined to operate more uh, you know, sooner rather than later. It's a retro, um, it's, it's not interperitoneal, assume, you know, probably they didn't 
have any peritoneal involvement. So you might be able to get in there and, and just um, freshen up the tissue. Probably also, if, I think he said it was a stage four, which means there's probably a, a big dilation of, of all the tissues, especially the, um, the rectum. So you, you probably have enough tissue to work with to do a closure of the fistula site and the vaginal site, take out the sutures that you're liable to find involved somehow. And then um, the, the, the downside there, of course, is the patient's liable to get her prolapse back, but um, you know, that, that's, that's how it goes, I guess. What do you think, Kim? Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's sort of similar to what Christina said before, if the tissues look healthy, um, you might as well try. But I do think getting a lot of that suture out of the way before you actually go back is helpful because I think that, although particularly if there's a braided suture in there like Vicryl. Similar to the kind of prolapse repair, do you do you notice a higher incidence of of prolapse after patients who've had fistula repairs, or you know conversely, do you change your approach? to your, your fistula repair or to your prolapse repair if the patient's had a prior fistula? No. No, I mean, I don't tend to, tend to do them at the same time. If there's somebody with, um, I'm trying to think how many times I've even dealt with this. I, a couple of times. Um, and I've, um, I guess I've done both, both, both ways, but if there's a way to stage it where you're doing the, the um, uh, fistula repair first and then let that heal and do the prolapse repair, I guess that'd be my preferred approach. The only time I can remember having a big rectovaginal fistula and prolapse was a patient who had a gallhorn pessary um, that eroded and we just repaired the fistula and did a colpoclysis. That was gutsy. Yeah. I why? It was like great. It's almost like a Lafort, right? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> uh, maybe you guys could talk a little bit more about your approach to patients who do have, have um, IBS or IBD. Colorectal buddy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, if I can get them in, I think that they are better managed if it's a small fistula medically. Um, a lot of those small fistulas were repaired with just medical management. Um, but some of them, I work collaboratively with the colorectal surgeon that does a lot of inflammatory bowel disease and, and it's humbling. I'm definitely out of my league there. So I got a question about that. If you have a patient with a prolapse where your ideal operation would be a sacral colpoplexy, and they've also got ulcerative colitis, but it's very much cooled down, would you do it your standard way uh, with mesh or, or would you modify? Hmm. That seems like off of the topic of the discussion. I know. <laughs> what do you think, Keisha? Are you? <laughs> Especially because it's kind of a tough one. I mean, I would probably shy away from putting any any mesh um, in that patient. But I also, I mean, if they've been well managed, medically managed, and completely stable, is it reasonable? Sure. Um, so. I could probably go either way, but I, I would probably hedge on on no mesh in that setting. Yeah, yeah just because. <laughs> I mean, if it's someone who had like UC that wasn't like active for 20 years, it's one thing. Right. Otherwise, even I probably would have to lean native tissue on that lady. Well, yeah. Or you could just maybe not go down quite as far with the posterior mesh. <laughs> anyway, sorry, be off topic. <laughs> Or you can technically use some rectus or some of the dissolving um, cadaveric fascia. Those are <laughs> actually good ones because. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think one of the big things too is just the, the undiagnosed IBD is also important for like the fellows, for, for all of us as urogyne providers to keep on our radar. Cause we've definitely seen, you know, I had a patient who presented with a Bartholin cyst um, that, um, you know, ended up, you know, then had some oral ulcer 
papers and, you know, had a whole stigmata and just had never been um, evaluated or worked up for that. And then when she was medically, and then ended up developing a small fistula, but with medical management, she corrected. So it's just always keeping that on your radar because the people who come in and tell you that they have um, it really does impact your surgical plan and your success um, um, with respect to your surgical outcomes. So you just really want to make sure you get them taken care of and evaluated further for that, if there's any red flags. All right. So I think that our time is just about up, and I think we've, we've addressed kind of most of our questions here. Um, do any of you have any kind of last minute comments? Otherwise, I'll kind of put up our concluding slide here. Um, thanks for being here. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for the time. I just wanted to remind everyone that um, our next webinar is going to be on Friday, April 17th. So this Friday, and that's 1030 AM and Eastern time. That'll be a diagnosis and treatment of um, bladder emptying problems in women. And that'll be by Victor Nitti. And then panelists were Dr. David Ginsburg and Dr. Christopher Tarney. Um, so looking, looking forward to that session as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone.